Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cisco Live and this master series studio. My name is Andy Shalaman, and I'm here to present about doing micro segmentation with ACI and titration. And next to me is Remy. Remy? Hey, Andy. Yeah. Seems fun to be here. It is. So Remy and I have worked together for how many years now? Too long. Way too long. Too long. <laughs> too long. Yes. So today's agenda is uh, we're going to be covering why doing micro segmentation is important how to do it with ACI and how to improve your security posture, and how to use titration to improve your security posture as well. But I really want to begin with why micro-segmentation is important. That's actually a really good question. Why is it important, Andy? Because uh, it Tell seems me like more. too much work. <laughs> <laughs> so why is micro-segmentation important? There's a lot of security risks we run into in, in, in an everyday world, and more and more times we keep hearing about people being breached, and, and really, very often, the breaches are about lateral movement across your network. And so if you look at the slides on top of the slide there, there's sort of the, the typical three-tier architecture, the web, app, and DB. And a lot of people would think that that's very secure because of the fact that they have firewalls between there. But what happens very often is you know, a single server can get compromised. And you know, sometimes this is just your HVAC server, vendor server. And in nowadays, in today's world, a lot of these servers are virtualized, and when they're virtualized, people tend to clone them, and when they clone them, they have to have the same security uh, vulnerabilities amongst all those servers. Generally, they're in the same patch level. So if one, get, one server can get owned, once it does get owned, with, a, with this type of setup, the lateral movement is quite simple. If you can own a server, you can own the second server next to it, and the, the one next to it as well. So, this just adds the, the amount of, of, of problems you can create. Sometimes they are not even the same type of server, but they're on the same patch level. So getting some kind of segmentation is very useful. So and does that mean, are you saying that, so just to understand, you're saying it's kind of open bar between all the servers on the same level? In general, in general, that's what we see. Wow, that seems fun. I know, this is a lot of fun for a hacker. Oh, yeah. So a very simple micro-segmentation use case would be something like, hey, I have my web servers. 99% of the time, there's no reason for my web servers to speak to each other. So if I could just keep them apart, just like I'm doing in the boxes here, if one of the servers does get owned, as we're showing in this slide, Fancy that's a bad Andy. thing. What's that? Fancy animation. I know. I, I get paid by the animation. Oh my god! Every click is an extra dollar. <laughs> 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 and so, if one of your servers do, does get owned, the likelihood of, of you getting hacked becomes a lot smaller, right? Because those servers can't talk to each other, and we do have some form of security between the, the app and the, the web servers. So that's a very simple use case for micro segmentation that some people would enjoy. Um, other ways of looking at it is you could have your 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 prod, your QA, and your dev all on the same subnet. Wait, wait, that never happens, Andy. What oh are you no, no, about? all everyone has a very, very well defined security posture, uh, and they separate all their VMs. I was a bit scared of what you're saying there. So you're saying that people <laughs> put that on a flat network? No, no, this <laughs> almost never happens. Okay. But on the very few <laughs> cases that this does happen. Having, this is a very simple segmentation process. Keep your prod away from your QA, your QA up away from your dev, and you're in good shape, and you can still use all the same subnet. And the idea is now your or automation orchestration can get a lot simpler because I don't care that I'm all on the same network. That makes sense. Yeah, and then another very simple use case is, hey, I don't have to split my web app and DB on separate subnets. If I can do some form of segmentation, I can say my web can talk to my app, my app can talk to my DB, and the usual, my DB cannot talk to my app. A very simple use case, but can be useful for some people. So is that more like simplify the kind of the networking constructs and uh, without getting without compromising security? Exactly. At least this is a simple way that people would consider micro segmentation as well. Okay. And but one thing that's super important that if you get nothing else out of this entire session. <laughs> And you probably won't. <laughs> you need to, you, you cannot do any kind of segmentation without having some sort of application dependency map. You need to know that app talks to DB and not to web. And, and, and how to do that is very, well, it's simple to say web, app, and DB. In the real world, it's never that simple. Oh, yeah. 
because you don't even know which servers are actually part of web and app and DB usually if you're talking about like 10,000 of workloads running across your environment. Yeah, and things can get really complex. So we have covered up the IP addresses here to hide the innocent. Uh -huh. But this is, this is a small, well it's not a small, this is what a real data center communication looks like. Oh, yeah. What possible tool could have done such a beautiful picture? I don't know, Andy, you'd have to tell me, because <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed that that seems like great communication. So what you're saying is that the little dots and the arrows are all the communications between tiers and so on? Yes, and look, the thickness means more or less. The thicker the bar is, the more communication is happening. Wow. It's like a chord bar or something, a chord graph a chord or something. Chart. Wow. Oh, yeah. I wonder I've, what could have done that. But to, to be serious, doing segmentation on this would be very, very complex. Yeah. Right? And so if you look at it, this is just one small data center or one real big data center, and all of those, all those conversations are going around. And to be fair, because I'm going to give away the ending, this is not something that you can just do with something like ACI. Oh. And then finally, if you look at a simple thing, this is a single application. So we were talking about web app and DB. That doesn't exist, right? Oh, really? The, yes. the famous three-tier app that everyone uses doesn't exist? That doesn't exist. It just broke this is universe. what an actual app looks like in a data center. And so you can see the complexity and the fact that we're going to have to do something a little more complex than just web app and DB. Which brings us to sort of the, the ways of doing enforcement, right? There are two types of enforcement points we're going to talk about today, a host-based and a network-based. And they all have good and bad things about them. I mean, the host space is close to the application, but it has some cons because it's, it's guest OS dependent, and you know, sometimes you, it can be complicated. The network base is also very good, and that's the one that you see with firewalls, general or access control lists. They're very good things that are distributed, and you can, do a lot of, you can do a lot of bulk of data, but there are some cons because A, you're not very close to the application sometimes, you have, you have uh, memory and TCAM requirements, and it just could be very complicated as well. So the real idea here, and the reason we're doing this as an ACI integration session, is because we feel that combining both a host-based and network-based tiered security is, is the right way of doing it. And it's good because it's tiered, and, and it's good because you can have operational diversity as well. So the idea is kind of going towards defense in depth with having some policies maybe a bit wider that can go uh, higher and then the farther you go down the stack, the, the more, let's say, fine you are in terms of policies? Absolutely. Wow. And if only we had some slides to cover that. Yeah, that, I mean, wouldn't that be awesome, right? That would uh, be amazing. So this I is see coming you to you. There are some slides then. Wow, so shocking to me. It, I think, should have looked at the slides ahead of this presentation. That would have been nice, but then. So, in short, to a hammer, everything is a nail, right? Yes. It's as simple as that. And so when we see a problem, uh, we try to apply the same technique every single time. And the problem we're having is that, well, I mean, some things are not very well enforced on network. That's just a thing that's like that. Um, you've connected to a firewall with over 1 million ACL, I'm sure. Ah, uh, just a couple, yes. Just a couple. You know but at the bottom, are. there's always a permit any, so it's okay. <laughs> exactly, the CYA protection, yeah. the famous one. <laughs> so yeah, no, absolutely. So in the end, you're thinking, well, okay, if I have that big, why can't I just put less policies uh, per VM and just have them across all the VMs? And so if you look at how the thing is done, on one firewall, you would have, for example, 1,000 policies. But maybe you might want to move to, say, hypervisor-based enforcement. But then, so you have two hypervisors, still the same amount of AMs. So you get maybe two times, uh, five, two times 500. Right. It's 1,000, I heard. Uh, I'm doing the math in my head. Yeah, it's very complex at this time. Or you can actually make it very simple, and you could have 100 times 10 policies. Obviously, in real life, it wouldn't probably not fall that perfectly in terms of spread, but that right. gives a good idea of where it goes. Absolutely, and, and, and it gets simpler when you do it this way. Yeah, even just think troubleshooting, I mean. There's never troubleshooting, everything always works. I forgot about that. <laughs> everything is about perfection, right? That's right. So if you take my very simple uh, classic ne enterprise network, right, it's always as simple as that. There's a firewall followed by a fabric, followed by VMs, right? 
that's what everybody's network looks like. That's what I thought. Uh, everyone, some people tell me that you can do more complex things. I don't get it. So let's look at the firewall at the edge. Right. It, it's a hardware box. It's so it means it can do high throughput. It can do some advanced features on it. So actually, it's a pretty good place to enforce incoming traffic. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, would you want to actually drag your traffic coming down from the internet down to final server to go and enforce? I mean, that seems a bit far. I probably wouldn't. It's not a great idea. I mean, nope. some people may have tried. Let's put it like that. But the problem with those boxes is, well, I mean, the blast radius is, I mean, it's pretty big. If you mess it up, um, you're kind of dead. The, the system is down. Yeah, it's, the, it's the good old story of, Hard outside and soft, chewy inside. Exactly, just yep. like chocolates. <laughs> so the, the beauty of that is, if you think about it, if you could get to have a very low rate of change at the edge, and then keep the kind of the higher rate of change uh, towards the interior of the data center, you're actually going to reduce the risk of breaking something as well. Absolutely, or uh, the risk of breaking everything is a better way. Actually, of it's, yes. that's probably much more accurate. Yep. So what you would do there is you would create some super coarse rules, like internet is allowed to access my load balancer report 80 and 443. Campus is allowed to access my DC on 389 and 443. That's it. That's it? And you don't change it. Ever? No. OK. So obviously, from a security standpoint, if you leave that like that, you don't do anything more, it's probably a bad idea. Where does my permit any go? So no more permit any, Andy. Oh. It's finished. No more, no, more ID. <laughs> no more job security for me. <laughs> you don't need it anymore. Fair enough. <clears throat> and then, now remember, we're layer layering, and I think that's really important. Don't stop at the first part. If someone, people are watching, be careful. Don't stop now. Listen to the whole thing. Uh, um, so now we look at ACI. ACI has this concept of EPGs, uh, uh, which we can simplify in zones. I mean, it's probably not fair, but uh, it's simplified in zone. And ACI happens to be ASIC driven. Yep. So if you look at that, I mean, it can take high volume of traffic, yeah, and basically it's going to handle that really well. Yep. But then again, do you really want to come and touch that thing every single day, modify policies? Uh? Absolutely not. Yeah, I mean, kind of makes sense, but why would you want to do that as well? No, you don't, you don't want to be touching the policies on that. It, that it may even be a change management nightmare. Oh yeah, my God, don't start with that. <laughs> That's so terrible. So let's look at that. Now we have some different sets of rules here, because now we can say campus is allowed to access dev over port 80, because you know it's dev, dev can go over port 80, and campus can access prod over port 443. Yep. Trusted can access shared over like 53, 123, 389, the kind of classical kind of shared services ports. Again, it's wide, but it's tighter yes. than the edge of your, uh, your network. So as you move forward, it's actually getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and those groups can also be dynamic. So if you're using something like, like VMware ESXi, I can tag VMs and SS tag VMs to it, they will end up in the right EPG. So it, it becomes dynamic without you having to touch the policy. Yeah, that's, uh, that's even perfect. So now everything is dynamic in your DC without change request. Exactly. That's the future. Uh, is that the future? That's the future. We're there. This we're is there. so exciting. We're there. Now we're getting to the final step. Ready? I'm ready. Let's talk about micro-segmentation. And when we talk, I would want to clarify, when we say micro-segmentation, we actually mean micro-segmentation. We don't mean micro-zones. Because I mean, that's Great. something that tends to be uh, confusing on that. So now we are moving one step down. Um, and now the traffic that's actually arriving to the host has been cleaned up quite dramatically. Like, no more internet traffic, campus traffic is clean, and now the access is actually restrained. So my rate of traffic is lower. And I have more workloads, so I can actually go much finer in policy. So I can go from one or two policies uh, at the edge, uh, three or four in the middle, to maybe 10 or 20 uh, so down inside the center. And now I can say, well, this Active Directory group is allowed to access this server report AD. And now you can create those kind of super, super core, uh, fine grain uh, policies uh, going in your environment, coming through dynamic attributes, uh, but if you weren't doing that on the fabric, you would actually end up being doing like so many changes per day uh, that I mean, you'd be unhappy. It would it would be a it would be a tough one to to figure out, right? So we we can even call this pico segmentation, even pico smaller segmentation. than nano. My God, we're, gonna, we're going to have to like 
copyright that. Yeah, I think that I sounds. Feel, a, I can feel the great. money rolling in as we speak. Yeah, I'm gonna make a T-shirt. <laughs> we'll make a T-shirt out of this one for sure. That's right. So that's kind of the idea of how deep you can go uh, at this level in terms of segmentation. And so now we'll we'll take one of those layers. Where we're, so one of the things I want to be sure that we all get to is the fact that. Nowhere does this mean that, hey, if you have uh, ACI or if you have titration or if you have ACI and titration, you throw away your firewalls, right? Uh, no. It's a defense in depth conversation. And it, it's maybe you simplify your firewall policy, but it, you, you will still need those firewalls there. Absolutely. And so now we'll talk a little bit about how to improve your security posture using ACI, and then you are going to take us home with amazing titration knowledge. Absolutely. Oh, I'm, I'm very relieved. I was hoping that that's where the slides were going. I think, let's see, yes okay. it is. <laughs> so, if the second thing I'd like to take away from this, the first one was you need to have ADM, an application dependency map. But for me, please, you should realize there is no such thing as running ACI in network-centric or application-centric mode. Are you shocked? I'm, I'm in total shock. I am shocked too. There is no such thing, folks. Let's just please learn this. What you're, what, th these are some terms that we came up with a little while ago where people were talking about just using contracts or not using contracts in ACI. And, and somewhere along the way there was a divergence. But the, the reality of this is that in ACI, there is no such thing as application-centric or, or, or network-centric mode. You can use both of them at any time. There's no reason for you to uh, lay yourself into a place where you're only using one or the other. So wait, there's no switch to be that application or network centric? There is no switch. There's not oh. a there's not a network centric button. I know we have every other knob. That knob does not exist. I, I didn't know that. I was I was looking for it for like the last four years. I know it's amazing, isn't it? Hey. So I guess the bottom line of it is that that you can bring things in without policy if you don't know what the policy is because you need an ADM, and. You can slowly move things to a policy-based model where you start adding contracts. And we're not going to spend a lot of time about covering how preferred groups works and things like that, but the reality of it is that there's all these tools inside ACI that you can use for, for getting into a, a policy model, which what people now call application-centric. So there's a few things that you need to know about ACI, and, and they are important when you are doing your security policy. ACI that uses uh, a concept of whitelist model. The default behavior in ACI is that two endpoint groups cannot talk to each other. Two endpoint groups, okay? Okay, that's default. We can check our checkbox and, and allow them to speak to each other, but the default behavior is two endpoint groups or two zones by default will not speak to each other without the use of a contract. Okay, so it's kind of whitelisting by default sort of thing. Exactly. Okay. And then you can even whitelist all the way down to within the endpoint group if you want to, where I can say, these are all my web servers, and frankly, they have no reason to ever speak to each other even though they're in the same endpoint group. Okay. We can even apply policy that says, okay, I will allow ping between the web servers and nothing else. So we can really be very fine-grained within that endpoint group range. But there are other things that are important to understand. When you're talking to your security team, you have to understand that ACI does layer four contracts, right? So at layer four, we do the contract. To, to be quite fair, it is, I would say, st st stateful light, meaning you do have a, a, a small state engine in the fact that you will allow the traffic back. So if I allow traffic 80, port 80 into a port group, I will allow the traffic to return without me having to open it. So it's not completely an ACL, but okay. it's ACL-like behavior. It's so, but it's not stateful. I want to be very careful here. Okay. We do not keep SYNs and ACK, ACK, flags, things like that are, are not things that we're ch ch checking, not sequence numbers or things like that. It's, it's a, an ACL. So we, we run at a layer four ACL. It's hardware-based. We can push stateful policies into the vSwitch though. We can use OVS for, for some stateful policies, but still at layer four. And then we can do some stateful connection tracking using AVE or some other tools. But the bottom line of it is still a layer four firewall. So if you're going to go to something that's more granular, something that's more defined, then you can go to the tration to some more granular policy. And if that's not the 
the use case, then maybe a next-gen firewall for that APG is the right way of using it, that they can look deeper into that, 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 that workload. Okay, I see. Okay? All of this is enforced at the leaf layer, and, and it's all hardware-based, and we can do it at line rate. So, if you have a 100 gig port, we can do policy at 100 gig. There is no penalty for applying policy. Okay. But let's look at the real world, right? One of the reasons that people end up in what we call network-centric mode is sometimes they bite more than they can chew. I know, I know, you know it's hard to believe. a bit more. Yes. <laughs> 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 because I think they come into this, this whole ACI thing and they go, you know what? I'm going to have an ACL for everything. Every single packet that will ever go through, we're going to create a policy for. And without having a good application dependency map, and it's very difficult, and sometimes you end up in a situation where either you, you just consume too much time, you make things too complex. So when you look at this application on the screen right now, that's a real world application. There would be 50, 60 contracts to make this thing work. It's doable but it's complicated when you first start out. But what we can do, what, what, what makes people um, more successful, in my opinion, is doing something like this. I can tell you that these seven VMs, these three containers, and these four bare metal servers are all part of the same application. And if I can just say, okay, I'm gonna take all these, all these different parts and put them as a single application, and I will put them into a single policy group, I don't have to go 44380, 197, blah, 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 all the, port 8080 and all that stuff. I can add them into one policy domain like this and then have contracts from the outside in and from that entire application to all my shared services. And now you're looking at five contracts per application and then this is a very easy thing to do with tagging of your VMs or, or using an IP address or VM name. You pick, the, you pick the, the way of doing it, you add them into a single application. Generally, applications do not have to talk to each other in, in the east-west way. They tend to go, go across the way you're looking at it that way. And, and generally, I can make sure that, hey, you go to my load balancer, that's done on the, on the firewall, as you were mentioning before, and then I keep all the rest of it as a single tier. Eventually, I can unpeel this onion, or un, un, I'm trying to find, what's a good word for here? I am lost. We can, we can unravel this whole thing, and then we can start <laughs> adding more policy and more contracts to it, but doing it the way I have it on the screen here, I think it's very achievable. People know which servers are part of which application. That sounds fair. I mean, and that looks a bit like application-based sort of segmentation. Um, it's simple to understand. Yes. Keeps the again low rate of change once it's done. Absolutely. So. And and this is a very achievable way of doing things. Yeah. We, and now to you, Remy. So let's Basil unravel us. the onion. Now. Yes. <laughs> so let's see a bit of how we can address that with iteration and what it adds on top of what Andy was explaining from an application standpoint. And indeed, the idea is to move from the application, which is maybe one EPG or maybe more, down to individual VMs with the less, let's say, maintenance or overhead on the ops team. We like ops team. We don't want to hurt them. And, and just so we're clear, Remy, they, they're giving me this, the stretch signal. They want you to talk about this for about 15 minutes. For 15 minutes? I'm feeling that you can do it. I can do it for like 20 minutes. All right, we'll do this. Let's Challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. So let's talk a bit about a real data center. All right. Because in the end, that's really what we're talking about. Uh, we've shown the kind of the simple diagram, uh, the one that has, you know, like three VMs and that's it. Actually, a real data center is a bit more complex than that. Sort of like that, 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 that diagram we showed, that, that, that chart we showed earlier with the exactly. hundreds and hundreds of flows. Exactly. Mm. And like, the best part of all that is usually uh, that's not running in one location. So you're talking about multiple sites, you're talking about multiple clouds, you're talking about mainframes. Oh, I love mainframes. <laughs> now so you have, you're, you're, you're getting into my sweet spot. Yeah, I see that, uh, I know it's of your age. Uh, so you know, yeah. Some token ring in there, just in case. I will put some token ring, absolutely. <laughs> and so we're talking about multiple layers of virtualization as well. Because I mean, in the same way, VMware comes in. Hey, we have lots of overlay solutions and stuff like that. Everyone has a bit of uh, VMware. Okay, 
Hyper-V comes in, hey, Microsoft will give you a good deal on licenses if you do virtualization with them. Then some entity in the customer is going to say, we have a container project. We're yep. just starting about that. Never heard that before. Oh, yeah. Is yeah. that a big thing now? No, no. <laughs> I think it's before where, don't worry. Yeah. Yes, it's. it's <laughs> <laughs> and then you start looking at things like the campus, because at the end, I mean, we're developing applications and delivering applications so people can consume them. So campus has to come in on that. AWS or Azure or GCP or any local cloud. We don't have any specific shares with AWS. I just want to make that clear. When should have gone with cloud. The cloud. <laughs> the cloud. cloud, yes. That's the French for cloud? Exactly. That's the French word for cloud. <laughs> so that's the environment we live in. And some things we can define in some areas, but there might also be some legacy in some areas yeah. where you might not be able to enforce for whatever reason. I mean, some people still run some very well, 6,500, I mean, that's still the case. Um, they do that, and also, they, they, they run workloads that can't have any kind of agent on them. Yeah. We, they're bare metal that we have no context into. I mean, it can be very complicated. No, absolutely. So when you're looking at this total mess, but well, I think we can say it's a total mess, yeah. we can derive the kind of rules that we have to define when we're building uh, the policy. And when we're building that, there's a few areas we need to look into. First one, we're trying to protect workloads at the end. Yep. That's, that's our end goal uh, for everything. However we do it, that's a goal. Absolutely. Connecting so, users to the workloads is what we're trying to do, and we're trying to do it securely. Absolutely. And so if you want to protect your servers, uh, uh, there's a few things we need to do. So microseg is one of them, uh, but actually, you should do much more in microseg. Yep, defense in depth, always defense in depth. Exactly. So this is the first thing we need to be able to do, handle scale. Yep. Seems stupid, but I mean, it's very easy to show a demo with 10 workloads. Yes, on a three-tier app. On a three-tier app. That doesn't have to have to use DNS or exactly. anything else. Exactly. Yes. Completely. Always internal. works in my lab. Yeah, I mean, what's wrong with that? So we see them every single day. Absolutely. So the problem with that is, a real environment, especially when containers come in. Uh, now we're talking about tens of thousands of workloads. And with containers also coming up and down constantly, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a very, very um, fast moving environment. You can bring up pods and seconds. Yeah, absolutely, seconds, and you probably have some kind of a software development lifecycle process, and yeah. then the guys kick off a build, uh, the build starts, and then uh, 500 pods come up, yep. the build runs, 500 pods go down. Exactly. You still have to secure them. Yep. You don't know how long they may stay. And uh, the other thing that I think a lot of people don't, don't realize about this is, even if you, you automatically are adding those 500 pods, don't forget you have to also stick, pull them out of your policy constantly. Exactly. And the policy churn is ridiculous. I mean, it can be hundreds per minute. Absolutely. Yeah. And think about that, if you're making those changes, if you're losing, uh, just to give you a, a, an idea, like we run builds uh, in Cisco multiple times per day. Right. Imagine if we had to update all our firewalls across the whole campus uh, at multiple times a day. I think yep. they might not be very happy about it. I believe that's going to be a little difficult, yes. So do now we have to do change management five times a day? Exactly. <laughs> you know, all the, the board approval, all that stuff, change request board. Uh, can't wait for the freeze, yeah. Oh, yeah. No more builds. No more builds. <laughs> now, the next thing is like, I haven't seen a data center yet, which is 100% bare metal or 100% virtual or 100% containers. Have you spoken to the folks at VMware? Everything is, is, is oh, VMware. Oh, yeah, I forgot, of course. Everything is VMware. Oh, that's going to come back to bite me on Twitter. I can feel it now. <laughs> it is going to bite you back, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to be able to do whatever we're trying to do. It has to work across everything. And to your point, I mean, some areas you can't put an agent. So, I mean, you have, um, I don't know, a big um, Ypsilon or something like that. So. Or Oracle sometimes won't let you put stuff on their databases, yeah. right? Because they would make it unsupported. Absolutely. Yep. So if you look at that, you're like, hmm, that might be a problem. So we need to build a solution. And when I say solution, I mean a holistic solution that actually works both for things which are on-prem, in cloud, in containers, in bare metal, on mainframes, on a storage server, and Absolutely. so on. So that's kind of a challenge around that. Do, but do we have a solution, Remy? 
We may, we may, but you have to stick in until the last slide to know that. We, ha we have a last slide. We have a last slide. Can't wait. <laughs> Let's talk about speed now. We talk about rate of change, but it's also the rate of application. So changing uh, the workload is one thing. Uh, you might have a change across 500 workloads. It's painful. It happens. But when you spin up your container, this container might have a full lifespan of five seconds. Yep. If you take one minute to change a policy across the whole environment, uh, that might be a bit of a problem. So you need to have some very high rates of change inside your policy as well to react to those events across your environment. And the way it's going today, it seems to be faster and faster and faster, and that's one of the reasons that containers are becoming such a popular way of doing applications moving forward. That microservice architecture is, is very interesting. Yeah, because it, it comes down to the cattle versus pets thing. It's yeah. like, if you have cattle, it's okay uh, for that. Everything I own is cattle, man. I have no pets. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> I, can, I can see you being a cattle guy. <laughs> Just throw it off. <laughs> <laughs> and then, as you mentioned, uh, how do you address ephemeral workloads? Yeah. You set a policy, you enforce it. If you forget to remove it, and you've just left a nice big hole uh, in your environment. Yeah. And something that used to be a web server may now be a database server. Or, exactly. I mean, I'm oversimplifying because containers don't do that way, but yes. So it would be kind of a problem. Yeah. So that's kind of your framework around it. And then there's a few things you need to add uh, to, convert, to take into account, sorry, uh, from a, a feature perspective. Lots of activity somebody, here. Somebody, somebody wants wants something. Yeah. <laughs> There's a quiz. Uh, so the quiz is about, I don't know what. Um, so micro I, I will listen to that while you speak. OK, make sure we win, please. <laughs> yes. So micro segmentation is the number one thing we want to achieve. Um, it's just, it's the biggest bang for your buck. That's really what it's about in there. As you said, if you block lateral movement, you're actually stopping people from moving around in the environment. So it is super important to get there. And it's complex. Very. It's, it's complex to, as you said, understand what you need to put in there, how you put it in there, where you put it. All those are the kind of questions you need to be able to address. Also, just being able to, to have a vi visibility of where it went, right? Yes. So all the visibility and the troubleshooting is incredibly important because just throwing stuff in there without having that visibility makes it unusable. And then you have the ops guy that chases you down and like, yeah, you told me. That's right. <laughs> We've been Open there. Open up that case. <laughs> <laughs> so micro segmentation is the best. It's the thing where you can invest uh, uh, probably the more time and you get the more kind of benefit from. But there's a few other things that you need to be able to do. Vulnerability management. Without going down to patch management, I mean, people get hacked lots of time because the firewall is badly configured. No. I hear that not too, uh, too often, though, let's be yeah. honest. It's usually a, a bug in software. It usually ends up being that. That it goes all the way back to my very first slide. Exactly. You're like, how surprising. Shocking. <laughs> I like how you tie that back together. It's fantastic, right? You're a genius. <laughs> so we're going through that world, and then we see vulnerabilities. But where you can have an agent, you can actually go deep and see the process. And you can see packages. If I see packages, I can see vulnerabilities. And if I see vulnerabilities, I can help take decisions. And guess what? You can't do that on your network. All I'm seeing is packets. And this is why we're talking about the fence in depth. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Because if once your, to be fair, once your server has been pawned, potentially you might want to say, OK, I might want to take a second action. Guess what? We have a solution. That's right. So then you have a few other things that you're going to look at. It's going to be integrity monitoring. Your point you were mentioning, you clone VMs to deploy more and more. So um, if you get one VM done kind of thing, yeah, well, you clone the problem. Exactly. So if you can understand how the system is actually moving on the platform, it actually gives you a quite a bit of information and understanding of what's going on, what processes hash, how they're behaving. Wait, HTTP server used to be process hash A on this one, and now it's B, but it's still A on two other servers. Gee, that probably means something bad. I think it's probably for something bad. Either the developer changed the binary directly, that's really bad, or someone else did it, and that's even worse. Then we look at things like exploitation and stuff like that. Things will go bad at some point. How do you understand what happened? Exactly. I think that's pretty important. And then we're looking at 
more volumetric kind of data on what happens from a data leakage standpoint. Is someone trying to exfiltrate large amounts of data and so on? Yep. And all that can be collected by the software sensor because that gives us all the value there. But things like data leakage, things like communication, things like dependency maps can actually be also fed back from information coming from the network. Absolutely. Cover the blind spots. Yep. So you can get a pretty complete view of that. Again, in depth, in depth, in depth. <laughs> exactly, just, it's just all about depth. going down yes. very deep and, and going ideally down to the actual socket uh, running on the server and to the binary. That's yep. what we want to go through. Absolutely. And finally, encryption, because encryption is fun, but now when you see something running over 443, uh, there is no way to know what's running behind it. This guy is really... He is, he is having more fun than we are. Yeah, he looks like it. <laughs> We need to go and cut his uh, mic off. But yes, yeah, so with encryption, uh, you actually need this metadata to understand what's running in your network. Absolutely. Otherwise, like SSH or 443, yep. totally doable. And it's pretty much uh, permitted everywhere. Exactly. Right? Yep. So those are things that you might want to look into. So that gives you a good overview picture of everything that actually needs to happen in is that environment. Is there a product that would actually help us with this, Remy? There is a product that can help you on that. And this product is called Titration. I, I'm going to collect that paycheck later on. Yeah. <laughs> you, you earned it, you earned it for once. <laughs> so what does Titration do? What Titration does, basically, everything you saw in the previous slide, yep. it takes and understands what's going on in the network. It builds out a map of what's going on. It tells you what you should enforce from a policy standpoint in your environment to get to an absolute perfect whitelist. Yep. Then, it goes and manages vulnerabilities across your environment. It tells you what is vulnerable. It tells you what packages, what server. It allows you to define policies based on those vulnerabilities as well. It helps you with detection of exploits, down to hardware exploits, because one thing we haven't covered is obviously like hardware-based attacks. I mean, you talk lateral movement, for example, between two VMs, but you could actually do that technically uh, through the CPU uh, with things yep. like Meltdown or Spectre. Yep. So you need to be able to understand that across the environment. Then we're looking at things like integrity, and finally we look at data leakage. But the beauty of all this approach is that everything we build here is actually streaming an open policy out of titration. So we actually can enforce it, we can stream it out, and then so the, what is there has been streamed out can be enforced in different points in your environment to get to defense in depth. Absolutely. So one single pane of policy, one view to go test, analyze, validate, uh, everything is fine. One point to actually even troubleshoot your policy across the whole environment. Exactly. It's pretty cool, right? That would be cool. Where do I buy more of this? I'll take your credit card and it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so to give you this overall picture uh, across the environment, uh, the final, uh, final view, uh, multi Take us home. There. Take us home, Remy. I will take you home right now. OK. So we have two sets of products. And people think to, seem to think that we're trying to compete between products. But actually, that's not the case. We're strongly believing in the defense in depth approach across the environment. And this defense in depth will go through hardware and software working together. I think that's fair. That's absolutely. That's the recommended option for our customers, right? And at the end, uh, you want to do things like network-based segmentation, network automation. You want to do those things in ECI. It's built for that. It works in there. It does a great job, yes. Exactly. And you want to do host base, process, that kind of details in a software product, exactly. which is then titration. And when you get them together, well, you can enforce everything in the middle. Absolutely. And and with, with this, also the policy model works exactly right. You don't have to touch the firewalls very often. You don't have to touch the ACI fabric as often. And then all the policy gets, the things that need to be changed quickly happen inside the tration. And we have probably an ops, different ops groups managing all of those, those policies Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. So in short, I mean, Andy, I think we covered some pretty deep uh, segmentation. We Without did. any uh, play on words or whatever. There's probably like word. three people still alive and, and, and not asleep, which is very exciting to me. Or they're blasting us. Hello, I'm choose. glad that you're still alive. <laughs> and thank you very much for joining us. Absolutely, thank you.